I started teaching at Harvard in 1984 as, a, as an assistant professor of uh, physics. And when I started teaching, I never asked myself, how am I going to teach? Which is kind of strange, right? Because when you do something new in your life, that should be the first thing you ask yourself. It was completely clear in my mind what I was going to do. I was going to lecture. After all, I had learned physics by listening to my professor's lecture. So I assumed that I had learned by listening to lectures. And therefore, I thought, I'm going to lecture for my students. So I started teaching. I was asked to teach a course that none of my colleagues here really wanted to teach. It was physics for pre-medical students. These were not students who wanted to learn physics. They already hated physics before coming into my classroom, but they, they just had to, to learn physics. You know, most of my colleagues, when they used to teach that course, they would feel very unhappy at the end of the semester because the students would give them very poor ratings. You know, pre-meds are not very kind to physicists. But that didn't happen for me. I got very high ratings. It's a five-point scale. And I typically got 4.2, 4.5 on, on a five-point scale. Also, even though these were not physicists but pre-meds, I could give them some really hard problems, problems that, you know, I'm not sure I would do well on, on an exam. So the students gave me high ratings. They did well on what I considered complicated exams. I very quickly started to believe that I was the world's best physics teacher. And that illusion, because it turned out it was a complete illusion, went on for many, many years. I would go through my classroom on a rocket-propelled cart. This was in, you know, many years ago, 30 years ago. I would climb up to the ceiling. I would have this big ball that would be on a pendulum, make it swing from my nose to the other side of the classroom. And I'd come back and the whole class would gasp thinking the, the ball would smash my nose and come back. So, I mean, it was like a Hollywood show. And I had these high ratings. And my students did well on exams. I was a star. But it was an illusion. Because after about seven years, I read an article that claimed that students learn nothing or next to nothing in their introductory physics courses. And the article showed data from thousands of students in the southwest of the United States, Arizona, New Mexico, California. And the data had been obtained by asking the students multiple choice questions using not typical, typical textbook problems, but using word-based problems. A car and a truck collide head-on on the highway. Is the force exerted by the heavy truck on the light car larger than the force exerted by the light car on the heavy truck? Are they equal? Is it the other way around? And these researchers showed that it doesn't make any difference whether you ask the questions before the students have had their physics scores or after. These were not physics majors. They were engineering majors, pre-meds. I read that article and I thought, not my students, you know, not Harvard students. But I'm a scientist. So one thing I've learned is you don't just make statements. If you make a statement, you better show data. So I decided to give my student this test. And I remember vividly what happened. As soon as they started to take the test, one student raised her hand and she said, looking me right in the, in the eyes, she said, Professor Mazur, how should I answer these questions? According to what you taught me or according to the way I usually think about these things? I went, what's the difference? Shouldn't you think the way I teach you? Anyway, by the time the test had been completed, my life as an instructor was changed forever. Because it turned out that my students maybe did a little bit better than the students in Arizona, and, and, but that's simply because Harvard is a very selective institution. But 
some did barely better than a gorilla hitting random keys on the keyboard. That shattered my illusion. And all of a sudden I thought, how can that be? I was in denial. I thought there must be something wrong with this test. And I did some more research. I did in the second semester when you get to electromagnetism, I compare students' performance on the word-based problems with the textbook problems. And I discovered that they could do the textbook problem, but they could not answer the much simpler word-based problem. And the reason is that my students were simply approaching the physics as recipes, which they were memorizing. It was not a matter of understanding the principles, no. It was a matter of, tell me how to do the problems. Give me the recipe. Well, for a while, I, th you know, I felt very unhappy, and I didn't know what to do. But then the solution presented itself serendipitously, totally accidentally. After the test had been completed, my students were shocked because they had done so poorly. And they were worried because the final exam was coming later. So they asked me for a special session at night to go through every question of that test one by one. And I remember coming to this question about the truck and the heavy car. I took two minutes to explain it. I made a drawing of the truck, a drawing of the car, I drew the forces, and I said, by Newton's third law, these two forces are equal. What's more to explain about it? And I turned, I'd done that with my back to them on, on, on the board, and I turned around, and I could see at once from their faces that they were confused. So I said, is there a question? They were so confused, they could not articulate a question. So I thought, this is serious. So I thought, I raised the board, I started all over again, and I thought, you know, maybe I should bring in Newton's second law and talk about acceleration. So in the next eight minutes, I managed to produce the most, in my opinion, brilliant explanation you could think of. And after eight minutes, the whole board was covered with equations and drawings. I turned around. They looked even more confused. And they could still not articulate the question. When I said, is there a question, they were, you know, they could not articulate what it was that confused them. I didn't know what to do. But I knew one thing. I knew that half of them had given the right answer. So in a moment of despair, I said to them, why don't you just discuss it with each other? I had 250 students in the class. And something happened that I'd never seen before. All 250 students started talking. It was complete chaos. They forgot about me in front of the class. I could have walked away. They would not have noticed. But what is really interesting was that in just two minutes, they figured it out. I'd taken 10 minutes, 2 plus 8, to explain it unsuccessfully, and they in two minutes explained to each other. I first thought, how can it be? But imagine you have two students sitting next to each other, John and Mary. Mary has the right answer because she understands it. John does not. On average, Mary is more likely to convince John than the other way around, simply by the force of logic. But here's the important point. Mary is more likely to explain it to John than Professor Mazur in front of the class. Why? Because she has only recently learned it. She still knows what the difficulties are that a beginning learner has. Whereas Professor Mazur in front of the class, has learned it such a long time ago. To him, it is so obvious, so simple, that he no longer understands why somebody doesn't understand it. It's what my colleague Steven Pinker in the psychology department calls the curse of knowledge. Once you understand something, you forget the difficulties that a beginning learner had. And I have to admit, when I was a student and I had a problem, I would often not bother asking my professor. I would go to a friend and say, hey, do you understand what professor such and such said? So soon after this serendipitous discovery, I changed my approach to teaching completely. I stopped lecturing. I stopped being the Hollywood performer in front of the students. Instead, I gave them the book and my notes to read. I asked them to read the book before coming to class, not after class. And in class, I teach by questioning. So I'll talk a few minutes, I'll ask a question. The student think about it, and then I have them vote on the answer. We actually use technology to do that. So they commit to an answer, and then I tell them, find somebody with a different answer around you and try to convince that person. 
complete chaos. They all start talking and arguing. And, it, and then you see these students go, oh, yes. And different students help each other understand the subject. I have them vote again. And usually many more students get it correct on the second try. And then we wrap up with a discussion, and I go to the next question. I call this approach peer instruction because students teach each other at the same level. Rather than teacher-student, it's student-student. And I, as the instructor, facilitate it. Instead of being the sage on the stage delivering the wisdom, which I now know I can't do, I am their coach. I'm the coach who guides them from the side. I've shown with this method that you can triple the learning gains. And books have appeared of peer instruction in chemistry, in astronomy, in mathematics. There are people using it in many different disciplines and many, many different educational settings. The key point is this, though. It's not about the instructor in front of the class. It's about the student and the student's mind. You don't learn by listening. You learn by doing. And it's, in a sense, this brings the doing back in the classroom. This technique can really be applied to just about any field that involves critical thinking. And I would say at a university, everything involves critical thinking. Here's the reason why. Education, in a sense, is a two-step process. One step is the transfer of information. And we have many ways of transferring information. One is books, the other is video. And of course, in the university, most transfer of information is done by lecturing. The professor delivers information to the students. However, the crucial part of an education is for the student to make sense of that information to have the aha moments, oh, I get it, so that you can apply the knowledge embedded in information in a new context. Unfortunately, when you listen to a lecture, there's no time for that aha moment, there's no time. The only thing you can do is take the information down. If you try to think, you lose track of what the person says because you cannot think and talk at the same time. So where for most people, I've asked myself often, where did that happen for me, these aha moments? Where did I make sense of the information? Well, that happened outside of the classroom. So in the standard approach to teaching, the information transfer is in the classroom. The sense making is out of the classroom. If you ask yourself pragmatically, which is the harder part? I think we all agree. It's a second part, the sense making. So why not flip this around and do the easy part outside of the classroom? the transfer of information, books, video, and then in class we think about it. You can do this with art history, you can do it with biology, you can do it with quantum information, you can do it with special relativity, you can do it with finance. And in fact, believe it or not, there are people in all of these fields at universities, not my own, but many who are using it, from finance to mathematics to French drama.